Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's already 11.06, so we want to get started. We have uh, a lot of information to absorb today. Um, so without further ado, I want to um, give the screen, uh, not really the stage, to Peter Berg to start with, uh, take us through the welcoming part. Thank you. Thanks, Latal. Can, is my audio on? OK, great. Hey, everybody. I'm Peter Berg. And, and together with uh, Susan Schneider, I co-chair the, the Jewish Federation uh, Community Mission to Israel 2021. So that's October. And uh, Latal's thumbs up. Uh, go to israeljustgo.com to get all the details. We're getting everything planned. Obviously, things are a little bit on hold right now, but we, we anticipate having a, another great mission. Uh, so I'm delighted to welcome everybody here. In October of 2018, my wife Karen and I uh, enjoyed our the mission trip, and um, a lot of you that are on here today were there with us. We had a great opportunity to to travel with everybody. Our speaker for this webinar is Uri Feinberg. He was one of our amazing guides. Here he is in the background. There's a picture of him. Speaking with, um, it looks like the Golan Heights maybe behind us, I'm not sure. Um, we learned a lot from him and, and happy to extend this opportunity to learn from one of the best in the business to all of you, the community members of Broward. So it's gonna be a, a, a really fun hour, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, both sessions are being recorded. Uh, we ask that you stay muted, allow Ori to let his presentation run smoothly. Uh, at the end, he'll answer some questions. If you want to put something in the chat box, uh, then we'll, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Keep in mind that we do have a time limit. And with, without further ado, I'd like you to, uh, to welcome Uri Feinberg. Uri, take it away. There, now I am unmuted, okay. There we go. It, Peter, thank you very much. And Lita, thank you. It is, it is really wonderful to be with all of you. And the challenge, of course, that we're all facing in this uh, very difficult times around the world is that we can't be together in person. And we're going to have to push that off a little bit. But fortunately, for, with many of you, I have memories of being with you in person. And now we get to move forward. And what we thought to do today, over the next hour or so, is as many of you know, as all of you know, hopefully that we're not physically or even through Zoom going on a tour of sites in Israel, but rather what we're going to do is provide, I think, a, a more in-depth foundation to why we care about Israel. That really has always been my guiding light or my guiding question. What am I doing here and why do I care? It's not just a question I pose to people who travel to Israel, but it's to myself as well. And I'm happy also to answer more questions about myself, but maybe we'll wait until the end to do that. And we're gonna jump right in as we, as you know, we're gonna be discussing over two sessions, the history of the state of Israel from 1948 until today. Having said that, I can't truthfully start in 1948, but I'm gonna steal time away from myself and take a half a step back just to get us up to 1948, at least to put us in the frame. A couple of other things that I'll share before I begin. One is that clearly we won't be able to get to everything. And hopefully by the end of this session and then the end of next session, we will have provided enough information at least to generate more questions or to strengthen what we already knew. And the second thing I'll say, uh, as far as housekeeping goes, and Peter used that term before, if for whatever reason during the presentation, it freezes or I drop out, I'll be back. Not to worry, and I will come back. So I'm gonna jump right in and we'll hope for the best. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. One moment. And center view, slideshow, move this over, and we are good to go. And as you can see, the history of the state of Israel and we are off. Now, there's going to be two sessions. 
The first one I, I titled pre and post state. Again, giving myself that, that the freedom to, to start earlier than 1948, just to get us in the right space. And then we're gonna move forward and see how far we go. Our goal will be to reach uh, the six day war, maybe Yom Kippur, maybe push a little bit beyond that if we can. Now, uh, next week, as you can see, looking inward and looking outward, we're going to be making our way from where we left off in the 1970s all the way until today and then beyond. So we're starting with pre and post state and we're off. Now, as I begin, and uh, just anybody who is recording or who's in behind the scenes, uh, whether it's Paulette or anyone else, if there's a possibility for me not to see myself, but to see somebody else in the small screen that I have open, it just helps me know if uh, I can't be seen or heard, somebody can give me a, uh, a, a thumbs up. So right now I only see myself. Okay. I chose to start with this image. And this image, Theodore Herzl on the one side, and you can see there's an excerpt from his journal that he wrote at the beginning of September uh, 1897. The reason I start here is because Theodore Herzl was not the founder of Zionism. He would be the first to say it. He would be someone identified with the beginning of political Zionism, but his world will be rocked and it's not so much that the Dreyfus affair is what wakes him up to the challenge of the Jewish people. It's more that the Dreyfus affair of that Jewish captain accused falsely of espionage uh, in the French army for Germany will be a tipping point for him. And he wakes up and realizes he has to put his life in a new trajectory, convenes the first World Zionist Congress in Basel, Switz in Basel and he will there in 1897, at the end of it, say these words. Essentially, no less than five years, no more than 50 years, there'll be a Jewish state. That will be significant as we move forward because we'll see what happens 50 years beyond that. As one example of the various kinds of waves of immigration that took place in that period of time, shortly after Theodor Herzl, we have the first Aliyah, first wave of immigration. We have the second Aliyah, the second wave of immigration. And that second wave will be made up of teenagers, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds who say, mom and dad, we love you very much. You're wrong, we're right, we know what to do. And they put the old Judaism behind them and they create a religion of labor. Uh, labor Zionism, working the ground, transforming ourselves and our surroundings with the sweat of our brow, speaking Hebrew as a vernacular, defending ourselves and working the land ourselves. And Rachel Blaustein, who really becomes the poet laureate of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, will be part of those waves of immigration. Once again, everything I'm doing right now is not part of our presentation. It's a precursor to our presentation, which is why I'm taking the liberty to rush through this part, just to give us a taste of what came before. During World War I, the British, on the one hand, the good guys, and yet it will be because of the British that much of the challenge that we face here comes to fruition, as, as they back three main horses, as it were, during World War I. There will be something known as the McMahon Hussein letters or correspondence that goes back and forth before British leadership and uh, ostensibly the one who is the leader of the Arabs in the region, or at least the largest clan coming out of Arabia, Sharif Hussein of Mecca, and a negotiation essentially that says, the British say, we'll give you a country of your own if you Arab people support us against the Ottoman Turks, without defining exactly where that bo those boundaries would be. Horse number two would be the Sykes-Picot Agreement when the French and the British and somewhat the Russians as well regardless of who's living here, will decide when the dust settles at the end of World War I, who is going to be in control of what countries and who is going to have influence on what countries based on the three of those superpowers. And the third horse, as it were, would be what was written on November 2nd, uh, 1917, the Balfour Declaration. The foreign minister of his British, uh, of, the, of his majesty's government says to the most important Jew that they knew, essentially the Rothschild from the British side of the family, His Majesty's government sees with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home 
for the Jewish people. Well, that's very nice. And you can read the rest of this Balfour Declaration, but it really doesn't say very much. First of all, 1917, who are the British to see with favor anything in this region? Two, what exactly is a national home for the Jewish people? Is it a country? Is it a state? What is it? And three, where in Palestine? So all of this really, on the one hand, means very little, and yet on the other hand, is going to be the first time that we begin to see a pot, a, the potential for a Jewish entity of some kind in the land of Israel. Then we enter into what will be known as the British Mandate period, the end of World War I, all the way to the, the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust. Now, I have a few images on the screen here that help us identify this mandate period. First of all, making good on their McMahon Hussein letters, part of the immediate aftermath of the uh, beginning of the mandate period will be the invention of creation of new countries in the region. And what we see here, where it says Transjordan, this Transjordan used to be part of a greater Palestine, as it was called. The name Palestine, by the way, is punishment from the Romans in the days of Hadrian when Palestina becomes a posthumous victory to the biblical arch enemy of the Jews who would be uh, willing to revolt against Rome in 132 to the Common Era. But this Transjordan becomes a country later to be known as Jordan. So from the get-go, two-thirds of what was Palestine becomes a new country, and we're left with the mandate that you can see here in white. In addition, we begin to see other waves of immigration. We have a cycle of events that takes place after World War I comes to an end. We have immigration of Jews, a continuation of the earlier aliyot, or waves of immigration from before the war. We have immigration. We have riots against those Jews who are arriving, headed by the leader of the Arabs here in Palestine, a guy by the name of Haj Amin El Husseini, who is seeing the country or the land disappear before his very eyes, or that that's the perception. And three, in order to impose what they called an even-handed policy, the British are gonna go ahead and, and, and create a series of white papers that put restrictions on Jewish immigration and Jewish land purchase. And we see this cycle of events in the early 1920s, the late 1920s, the mid 1930s, even on the eve of World War II, and even after the Holocaust is over, we still see white papers in effect. On the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you can see the various underground and defensive units created by the Jews who were here. The main body of the defense, 1920, Haganah, which means defense, the parent organization of the Israel Defense Force, the Palmach, which was the crack commando unit of the Haganah, and the Mossad Laliabet, today just the Mossad, Israel's CIA, then created to smuggle Jews in under the noses of the British in clandestine immigration. And the Etzel and the Lechi, also known as the Irgun, by the way, the Etzel was, as the first word of the three-part acronym that makes up the word Etzel. Uh, both under, underground organizations, each thinking they knew how to oust the British better and defend the Jews better against the Arabs. And we'll see that, in fact, the Irgun, which was commanded by Menachem Begin, will, in 1939, having already broken away from the Haganah, with its own vision of how to defend Jews to be more offensive, they actually fall back into the fold of the Haganah and join David Ben-Gurion and the Haganah when they say, we will fight the Nazis as though there's no white paper and fight the white paper as though there's no Nazis. I'm not quoting verbatim. We're gonna join the effort in the war in Europe or North Africa, and we will continue to smuggle Jews in. The Lechi will break away from the Etzel and say, are you crazy? We have to get the British out no matter what the cost. The Holocaust comes to an end. And clearly this isn't a session on the Holocaust. I'm just gonna to come to the end. And we begin to see a need, as you can imagine, to bring Jews to Palestine and the white papers are still in effect. Clandestine immigration continues and the Exodus 1947 will be a very famous ship within the 122,000 Jews who attempt to immigrate clandestinely. Most, by the way, fail and don't succeed because the British catch them. The exodus sets sail in July of 1947. Originally, the President Warfield, 
uh, a uh, ship, a uh, uh, freight and passenger ship that went from up and down the Chesapeake uh, Bay and was used in World War II. Eventually we'll have 4,500 Jewish immigrants and who will be uh, smuggled into Palestine, or at least that's the attempt. The British will find out, they'll ram the ship 22 miles off of the shores of Haifa, and ultimately those 4,500 will be sent back to Europe, most of whom will only arrive after the state of Israel is founded. But this is that reality. And then during that 1947 period, the United Nations will send a fact-finding team to Palestine called UNSCOP, United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. And they will go ahead and spend about a month or so traversing the land between June and July here. They will hold multiple commission se uh, uh, sessions, interviews, and ultimately will make a decision based on the facts on the ground that the British have lost control over what's happening here. And they will give their recommendation to the United Nations and the recommendation will be a partition plan of Palestine. And what you can see here on the map, the light white color is going to be the area designated to be provided to the Jews to be a Jewish state. And the darker area in the center above and below is going to be an area designated to be given to the Arabs who are living in what was previously called Palestine to become an Arab state. This will be voted on on November 29th, 1947 at Lake Success in the United Nations in New York. And it will be accepted by the uh, plenum with uh, 33 for, 10 against, and 13 abstentions. This is unreal. Think about it. Since the days of Theodore Herzl, no less than five years, no more than 50 years, he says in 1897 there will be a Jewish state. And in 1947, the United Nations says yes to a partition plan. Visionary prophet just gets lucky, maybe a little bit of all of the above. And November 30th, 1947, once the Jewish leadership accepts this partition plan and the Arab leadership rejects it, I say leadership because we don't know what the Arab people wanted. We do know that Haj Amin and also his nephew Abdel Qadir El Husseini, not to mention the Arab countries around, will reject this plan and the War of Independence will begin. The first phase of the War of Independence is internal, meaning the Arabs against the Jews and the Jews against the Arabs. And that will go until May 14th, 1948. In the aftermath of the uh, partition that you see here and the excitement in the streets, the war begins. And on May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion will, along with his provisional government, will gather in the Art Museum of Tel Aviv and begin a 32-minute ceremony that will change the trajectory of the Jewish people forever. Let me take a half a step back. In the week leading up to May 14, 1948, by the way, why May 14? Because the British were supposed to officially leave Palestine on, at midnight between May 14th and May 15th. Now, 14th was a Friday. 15th was a Shabbat, was a Saturday. And therefore at midnight was already Shabbat, of course. And David Ben-Gurion and his team have to decide, do we declare a state, first of all, at all? And if we do, do we do it at midnight? Does that mean we're declaring a state on Shabbat? Now, even though most of the leadership at the time were secular Jews, it didn't seem that this was the appropriate uh, idea to, for a Jewish state to be established on a Shabbat. Do we wait until Saturday evening after Shabbat is out? Well, there's no such thing as a vacuum in the Middle East, and therefore, that's also off of the table. And therefore, they decide to move the event up. By the way, the decision to, uh, to have, to, the decision to declare a state was also uh, on the balance of one vote, David Ben-Gurion's vote, because he realized after hearing from his generals that it was a 50-50% chance of survival once we declared a state and all of the Arab countries around invaded. 50%. Now, to be clear, the Jewish people and the state of Israel are not defined solely by the events of the Holocaust. However, three years after the 
horrific disaster that happened to the Jewish people. The thought of a second Holocaust was uh, front and center. And yet Ben-Gurion realized, if it's not now, he said, then it's never going to happen. The decision is to have it. And by Thursday, we still don't know what we're going to say. The declaration, the text of the Declaration of Independence has not yet been written as they're trying to figure it out. And I'm not going to get into all the details of the declaration itself. But those of you who want, go ahead and compare it to the American, the United States Declaration of Independence. And you can see there's a lot of uh, mirroring ideas that are presented also in the Israeli one. In addition, there are very specific and topical to the Jewish people in the land of Israel uh, ideas as well. Whether it's the historic connection, the biblical connection, whether it's the ongoing yearning throughout our exile to be connected here to the land. And in addition, we also know the fact that the United Nations said yes to a partition plan. That's also stated there. It's also mentioned that we reach out, Ben-Gurion says, to our neighbors in peace and to those citizens of the state of Israel who are not Jewish. You will be equal citizens, speaking to the Arab population, and to the, to the Jews around the world. We call you to be partners in this endeavor. All of this is going to come out in a 32-minute session. Now, once the decision was made to declare, we have to decide where. Why not in Jerusalem? Jerusalem's under siege by the Jordanians on one side, the Arab villages on the other. Why not in Habima Theater in Tel Aviv, the large venue? Too much of a target. We know Egypt's going to attack immediately and bombard from the sky, and therefore the art museum. And you can see just from the photo here of the art museum, it's almost bunker-esque, high windows. You actually descend to a lower level and invitations go out. It says very clearly, come to a festive occasion of the declaration of the Jewish state. The name, by the way, was not in the invitation because it hadn't yet been decided upon. And it says very clearly, come dressed for festive occasion. And two, make sure you're not late. And three, don't tell anybody. We're not so good on the share on the secret keeping uh, because in the next morning in Japan, the headline said very clearly uh, that Ben Gurion plans to declare us Jewish state today. And yet it starts exactly on time at 4 p.m. Now it's an art museum. We have to borrow the chairs from the local cafes. We have to borrow the Persian rugs from the Persian rug dealer down the road. And we have to borrow the microphones as well and the speaker system because we want to broadcast to the world. Now take a look for a second, the microphone on which Ben-Gurion was reading the declaration that had not yet been calligraphied, which is why he is reading from a, just a piece of paper. That particular microphone, you can see the close-up over there, has a word in front of it, and the word is tzlil. Tzlil means note or sound, which was the name of a, an electronic shop around the corner. And the guy says, listen, I know you can't tell me what it's for, but whatever it is, my, the name of my shop should be front and center. So this was really the first free advertising in the Jewish state. However the case may be, once this happened in this event, which again changed the trajectory of the Jewish people forever, at the end of which Ben-Gurion will make it very clear, long live the state of Israel, as though wafting down from the heavens, Hatikva, the national anthem of the Jewish people, now of the state of Israel, will come down from the heavens, very poetic, and yet the reason was there was no room for the symphony, and therefore the uh, symphony was placed on the second floor. Moments after that, Ben-Gurion leaves after taking the gavel, bang, 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 long live the state of Israel, and he knows that the second phase of the war is going to begin. When that happens, you can see all the red arrows to make a very long story short and so long in fact that this will be our longest war and our most painful war up until today. Every Arab country attacks simultaneously essentially as well as Arab countries that aren't sharing a border with us. And when this comes to an end in February and then into March of 1949, you can see here that the boundaries that Israel will have when this war is over, you can see the blue, the light blue area that we see on the map will in fact be more territory than the Jewish people in the land of Israel would have had, had the Arab leadership accepted the partition plan. 
And as you can see, the orange over here in what is known as the West Bank of the Jordan River, uh, this is now going to be controlled by Jordan. And the red over here that you can see in the bottom left of the map is going to be controlled by Egypt. Now, when this war comes to an end in 1949, a few new terms that will be introduced to the world stage lexicon, one is going to be the green line. Now, the green line was a term devised when, in September of 1949, on the island of Rhodes, there were Jordanian generals and Israeli generals, and someone says, hand me that green wax marker over there. Let's see where your troops are. Let's see where our troops are, and let's outline that, and that becomes the green line. And we'll, of course, come back to that because that will also very much um, be a part of our geopolitical conversation moving forward. In addition, we're hearing terms of refugees, and we're hearing terms such as Nakba. Now I'll come to both of those. First, I will tell you that in the aftermath of this war, 1% of the Jewish population of the state of Israel will be killed during the War of Independence. It is our most painful war. 6,000 uh, Israelis will be killed in this war. In addition, we know there are refugees. Now, the refugees that we speak of, there's two main groups. One uh, are Palestinian refugees. Now, as a nation, Palestinians exist. However, at that time, in the aftermath of the mandate, it should be clear that when the British spoke of Palestinians, they spoke of the Jews living in Palestine. And when they spoke of the Arabs living in Palestine, they spoke of Arabs living in Palestine. Again, that doesn't take away from what's going on today. But in this particular time, there are Palestinian refugees that come out of this war. In fact, about six to 700,000 refugees. Now, if anyone goes ahead and tells you that there's only one reason for the Palestinian refugees. In my mind, either they don't have all the information or perhaps they're trying to mislead us. Now, and that's true, by the way, if someone is far on the left and has only one reason or someone is far on the right and only has one reason. When this happens, uh, we should be clear that not all things, but many things have more than one reason. And that's the case here as well. And I would say, there's probably three main reasons that we have Palestinian refugees today, or at that point at least. One is because, well, people don't want to be around war. They don't want their families to be around war. And all we need to do is to look at the human disaster that's been happening in Syria for the last nine years, since March of 2011. We know that before the war in Syria, 22 million people lived in Syria, and today about 50% of that population are refugees, either internally or externally from Syria. People don't want their families to be around war. That's one. Two, during the war, the Arab countries around, and I will just to clarify, if the first phase of the War of Independence that starts November 30th, 1947, and goes to May 14th, was an internal war, Jews against Arabs within the boundaries, of what was then called Palestine. The second phase of the war will be all the Arab countries around us. And those Arab countries are gonna tell the local Arabs who are living here, get off of the land, let us come in, destroy the Zionists, and then no compromise needed. So many left for that reason. And three, because Israeli troops during the War of Independence came into cities like Ramle and Lod and Jaffa and even Haifa, and said to many of those Arabs who are living there, we don't have the time, the wherewithal, or the ability to discern right now who is friend and who is foe. Jordan is that way. Egypt is that way. Go. Now, that statement which I just made should not be an indication to anyone to decide for themselves who Uri votes for. Because what we have here are facts, and I'm sharing the facts as I understand them. It's important to recognize no matter if somebody is far on the left, or far on the right. These are the events, as I understand them, to have taken place. Now, there's also another group of refugees that oftentimes is not spoken about. And that is, those are the Jewish refugees. In fact, about seven to 800,000 Jewish refugees who are coming either from Europe or from Arab countries. Arab countries are kicking their Jews out, leading up to the War of Independence and in the, during and in the aftermath of. 
So that is also important to incorporate into our overall picture of what is going on. Now, the word Nakba is an Arabic word which means catastrophe, and that will be the name given by the Palestinians to the War of Independence. And you can see and therein lies some of the challenge when you have a two different populations in the same country, each with a very different explanation and definition of momentous events in the history of that state. Not to mention our neighbors who will also look at that and it's very indicative of their attitude towards the state of Israel, of the countries around us. Now, once this war is over, we begin to see a few things take place. First of all, and now I'm going to remove myself from the conversation about external issues, meaning the Arabs internally within Israel or the Arabs living out of Israel and the Arab countries, etc. And we're only going to look inward to the Jewish reality. In this particular case, Israel will double its population within just a few years, 600,000 Jews of the War of Independence. And then by 1951-52, we're looking at 1.2 million where are they coming from? They're coming from Arab countries. When David Ben-Gurion will make it very clear, brothers and sisters, come, this is your home. We don't know what we're gonna do with you, but we'll figure it out later. Better that you should be here. In fact, that was one of the reasons the State of Israel was founded to begin with. This is just one particular um, uh, uh, wave of immigration called Operation Magic Carpet. In 1949, when 45,000 Yemeni Jews are Yemeni Jews will arrive in 380 various airlifts. This was transformative for the Jewish people's psyche to be able to say once and for all, we are going to take care of our own. And yet, we have nowhere to put them. We have no infrastructure to speak of. We have no uh, exports of any kind. We only have imports. We have no money. We're dealing with security issues, ongoing, uh, uh, still reeling from our disaster that we felt, even though we won in the War of Independence because we weren't annihilated. The pain of loss was almost too much to bear. So what do we do with these six to 700,000 refugees that are coming, Jewish refugees? And it should be clear within a decade, what was once the most synonymous word to the word refugee, which was Jew, was no longer the case because Israel and other countries, but Israel says, come. And when we do, we place these Jewish immigrants, mostly from Arab countries and from North Africa uh, and from uh, Persia, although also Jews who come from Ashkenaz, from Europe, meaning Holocaust survivors who come from there, we place them in shanty towns, Tent cities, these are called ma'abarot, from the word ma'avar, transit shanty towns. The idea was maybe a few weeks, a few months, and you're already going to be placed in somewhere within the state of Israel. However, in more cases than not, there were those who were here for several years. Now, uh, in a moment, I'm going to share a short clip of a movie called Salah Shabbati. Salah Shabbati is one of the iconic movies created here in 1960s depicting the Israel in post-war of independence. When Mizrahi Jews are arriving, it's a comedy, and it was nominated for the best foreign film in the Oscars in that year. But it depicts a very challenging look at how the institution of the state of Israel dealt with those newcomers. Salah Shabbati, which is, the, is a Jewish name, yet Arabic sounding is going to, and that's the gentleman on the left of the table here meeting his Ashkenazi friend, Salah Shabbati is essentially Slicha Shabbati, excuse me for showing up. So we're, it's, a, it's a hard look. So soon after the founding of the state, Israel finds the wherewithal to critically look at itself. Hopefully the sound will work, but there are subtitles if not. They're arriving at the Ma'abarat. Higano. <laughs> <laughs> 
لا ما تتضحك لا ما ما يغسك القشطة عند أبا سلاح سلاح شاباتي ما كشالك ليس جي ما قوم يا فيجة هربي عبيق ما دايبا عدن كل جيشتين بما عبرها يفني الشاشني Okay, so again, point, the reason I pointed that out is because this relationship that is created in the aftermath of Israel's altruistic reasons for bringing the brethren and sister into the land of Israel, to the state of Israel, all the right reasons will be the foundation for tension between those Mizrahi Jews and the word Mizrahi is a more accurate umbrella term to describe those Jews who are not Ashkenazi meaning Jews who hail from Europe, but Jews who not only Spartic, meaning hailing from Spain, but from Iraq, from Morocco, from Yemen, etc. That would be the foundation of the tension, so much so that a second tier society would be created with the Ashkenazi elite, at least elite in their own minds, will create a movement by the late 1960s called the Black Panthers. Now, the Black Panthers would emulate the Black Panthers in the United States, and essentially it would be that movement, grassroots movement of Mizrahi Jews here in the state of Israel that would uh, create a political upheaval in 1977 and place the Likud party in power, and at the helm of the Likud party would be Menachem Begin. Speaking of Menachem Begin, we have this quote on the screen right now. Again, we're just looking inward right now. In 1952, David Ben-Gurion has to make a decision. Do we accept reparations from Germany, West Germany, for officially property lost in the Holocaust? Now, Ben-Gurion at the helm of the State of Israel, Prime Minister realizes that if we don't accept this almost $1 billion in tax goods and cash and funds, etc., we have no state. We're dealing with all the challenges that I mentioned, and we have no state, therefore we have to accept the money. Menachem Begin will get on the plenum of the Knesset and make it very clear, Mr. Ben-Gurion, how much is my dead family worth to you, he will say. We will never accept blood money. When they fired upon us, I said no. Now I say yes. We will burn this country down before we accept blood money from the Nazis. He's referring to the early hours of the state of Israel's birth when David Ben-Gurion will give an order to open up fire on the Altalena ship, which was a ship of weapons being brought on, to, on shore by the Irgun or the Etzel. Again, the Etzel had not yet converged with the soon-to-be-born IDF, and Ben-Gurion knew if we are not unified, we will fall. Uh, there's a real challenge there, and it seems that so soon after the founding of the state, we're going to be at civil war. Uh, ultimately, Begin will decide not to continue the battle against Jew against Jew. But here he says, now this is worth fighting to the very end. Ultimately, in the end, it's put to a vote within the Knesset, within the parliament, and it is accepted. These are the challenges of the early days of the state. If this wasn't enough, 1960 will be a watershed moment in the annals of the history of the state of Israel. And in 1960, Israel will reach beyond its borders to Argentina. They will find themselves outside of the home of Ricardo Clemente, which was a, uh, a cover name for Adolf Eichmann, who was a colonel in the SS during the Holocaust and was essentially responsible for the implementation of the final solution. In May of 1960, after he was abducted to Israel, Ben-Gurion gets in front of the Knesset, in front of the, the plenum of the Knesset, and makes the short, brief announcement that you can see on your screen. It transforms in a moment who we saw ourselves as being as a people. And the reason I chose these two photos of the Eichmann trial that began about eight months later. The reason is, is because Gidon Hausner, who is the chief prosecutor in front of the three-judged panel, we don't have a, 
uh, a jury system, we have justices, will bring 100 testimonies. We will bring 1,600 documents. And for the first time in the history of the short, the short history of the state of Israel, we will begin to hear the personal stories of our families. Why, why now is the first time? I'm coming back to one of the reasons the state of Israel was created, although not the only reason. One of the reasons was to be a safe haven for those Jews. And in the immediate aftermath of the founding of the state, Israel said to its brethren and sister in, who had survived the Holocaust, come, this is your home. Why? Because we go way back. We do communal memory better than anyone else. Why did we leave Egypt? We know. How? We have a Seder every year to tell us. Why do we celebrate Hanukkah? We know. And that happened 2,200 years ago. We get it. However, when you arrive, survivors of the Holocaust, do me a favor. Don't tell me your personal story. Do me a favor. Keep your arms covered. I don't want to see that number you may have on your arm. Tell me something. Was it really that bad? Tell me something, survivor. Why didn't you fight with Mordechai and Alevich in the Warsaw Ghetto? Because if you would have fought with Mordechai and Alevich in the Warsaw Ghetto, you wouldn't have survived. But at least you would have gone down swinging. Now, this is terrible. It sounds terrible. And yet we have to understand the context in which these statements were being made. We have to imagine that, first of all, how can we expect those Israelis to truly understand anything that's told to them about what happened in the Holocaust. Till today, we can't fathom. Two, how can we expect those survivors to find the words to explain what they went through? Three, in the minds of those Israelis who founded the state of Israel, they were the embodiment of that generation that came at the beginning of the 20th century and said, we will not hide in the corners ever again. We are the new Jew, not the old world Jew. And therefore, you survivors, who most likely hid or did what you needed to do to survive and didn't fight back, need to be more like us. This moment, when we hear the personal stories of why mom cries every single night, why dad screams, why we have no uncles or aunts or cousins or grandparents. We finally hear why as testimony after testimony, witness after witness gets up and says what this man did to them. This will be transformative. And as we go through the 70s, we'll talk more about where that continues, that notion. In addition, still within the 1960s, in the Declaration of Independence, it makes it very clear Jew or Christian or Muslim, Jewish Israeli, Arab Israeli, we are all equal in the eyes of the law. In fact, Israel is the first country in the Middle East to give the vote to Arab women, to all women, to all men. There were even mem Arab Israeli members of Knesset, of the parliament, the first Knesset in 1949. And yet, the Arab population of the state of Israel was placed under martial law. There was not freedom of movement. You had to get special permits to leave your village. There were curfews for the Arab population, meaning the Declaration of Independence was not being implemented to its fullest. In 1966, a decision is made if we are going to fulfill in our own eyes what we see ourselves reaching, we have to repeal this martial law. Now, just to be clear, this is within the context. Maybe this is connected and maybe it's not. But by up until 67, Israel has more than a thousand Israelis who will be killed in terrorist acts that are conducted by cross-border raids, not necessarily by local Israeli Arabs. And yet, the context is that Israel is not dealing with its population, its diverse population, as it saw itself dealing with when it signed its Declaration of Independence. This comes to an end in 66. This is before the Six Day War or any of that. And then the Six Day War. What was the Six Day War? Well, first of all, 
the Arab world will be led by Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt. He will unify the Arab world and make it very clear, if it wasn't, they are going to destroy the Zionist entity. And they begin in the months leading up to and in the weeks leading up to what would be called the Six Day War. They will begin to move troops into the Sinai Peninsula. When they do this, they are going to encounter the United Nations that are situated in the Sinai since 1956. And what was called the Sinai Campaign, a brief um, mini war that unfolded between Israel and Egypt with involvement by British and France. And it's a side story meaning it's important and significant, yet doesn't necessarily direct the geopolitical understanding of our region. The UN says to the Egyptians, if you continue to move your troops into the Sinai, we're out of here. And Egypt says, fine by us. And they move their troops in and the UN leaves. In addition, Egypt closes the Straits of Tehran to international shipping. This is an act of war. They nationalize the Suez Canal. In addition, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you can see where the Gulf of Aqaba or the Gulf of Eilat extends to the Indian Ocean and connects with the Gulf of Suez. The Egyptians closed the Straits of Tehran to international shipping. This too is an act of war because this is a lifeline to Israeli ships coming to Eilat. In addition, Egypt, along with Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and other countries will be involved in sponsoring ongoing terror against Israel. And then on June 5th, 1967, Israel will go ahead and start the Six Day War. Now, obviously, Israel doesn't start the Six Day War based on what I just told you. There was, in fact, such fear in Israel at the time that there was a joke going around that the last one to leave should shut the lights at the airport because that's the only way we're going to survive. Not a joke was the fact that thousands of graves were being prepared in the national parks in Tel Aviv and stadiums in anticipation for a second Holocaust. And on June 5th, 1967, Israel begins what should have been called the One Day War. Because within one day, essentially, all of the Sinai Peninsula was in our hands when Israel takes out 85% of the Egyptian Air Force while it's still on the ground. Then it should have been called the three and a half day war because it tells Jordan, hey, King Hussein, listen, we're not interested in Jordan right now. We're not interested in the West Bank right now. We're not interested in the old city or the Western Wall right now. Stay out of it and we won't get involved with you. King Hussein says, I can't sit by while you're going to be annihilated by my Arab brothers. He begins to bombard Western Jerusalem. And within three and a half days since the beginning of the war, Jerusalem and all of the West Bank are in Israeli hands. Very famous uh, statement is made on that Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. The Temple Mount is in our hands. And then the settlements, Kibbutzim and Moshavim, the agricultural communal settlements north of the Sea of Galilee, that you can see where my cursor is, tell the government, uh, Levi Eshkol, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, Moshe Dayan, the guy with the patch, and uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who is the Chief of Staff, the head of the military. If you don't do something about the Syrians, we're out of here. What are they referring to? They're referring to the fact that the Syrians over here in the northern part and the Golan Heights had been for 19 years looking down on the Hula Valley below and continuing to bombard them all the way through those 19 years. And those kibbutzniks were not going to have themselves raise another generation in the bomb shelter. And Israel realizes this is the time to ultimately push the Syrians back and be done with all of the threats around Israel. When this happens, uh, miracle of miracles, within six days, Israel will expand all of its borders to include all of the gray that you see on the screen. Now, within those six days, we will triple our landmass. We will push the Arab world away from our boundaries to be able to protect ourselves. We will send a clear message to the Arab world, we are here to stay, and yet, we will lose 660 Israeli soldiers, even when there is an elation within Israeli society. And those of you who remember, the Jewish world outside of Israel is also walking on clouds. Once again, we can stand tall and strong. Unfortunately, this wouldn't last. It wouldn't last because, and I have here an earlier picture of Golda Meir, 
a pillar of Israeli leadership already from early 1920s when she arrives from Milwaukee after immigrating to the United States. She will become an integral part of the leadership of the Zionist movement and will be the head of the Labor Party in the late 60s when she becomes prime minister and will be at the helm when the Yom Kippur War will begin. Now, between 1967 and the end of the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War of 1973, a few things are going on. First of all, in the immediate aftermath of the Six Day War, Moshe Dayan will make it very clear if the Arab world wants peace, well, they have to call us. Now, on the one hand, we can say this sounds pretty uh, militaristic, and yet it's important, I believe, to understand the context in which this is said. In his world, 19 years of ongoing terror against Israel, not to mention the War of Independence and the rejection of the partition plan, that's the frame in which uh, um, Moshe Dayan is making this claim. Simultaneously, within the Arab world, the Arab League in North Africa will make it very clear, the three infamous no's, no negotiation, no recognition, no peace with Israel. In addition, Israel will begin the creation of what will be known as Jewish communities in the area of Judea and Samaria, also known as settlements in the occupied territories, also known as the West Bank. Now, depending on one's political purview, you might say occupied territories, Israel occupied them in 67, negative connotations, or Judea and Samaria using biblical connotations and therefore having that connection, more of a right-wing connection. Or I would say the more generic term we can use, even though this can also be politicized, is the um, uh, West Bank, and that's what I'm going to use. But the creation of these settlements or these Jewish communities, once again, if anyone tells you there's only one reason that Jewish settlements were created in the area of the West Bank, either they don't have all the information, if you ask me, or they're purposely trying to mislead you. And again, that doesn't matter if that one reason is coming from the far left or the far right. And I would say there's probably three main reasons that we have these Jewish communities, these Jewish settlements. One, is the historic, religious, ideological reasons. Meaning, in the aftermath of this miraculous six-day war, why wouldn't we want to settle on the land where Abraham and Sarah traversed? Why wouldn't we want to settle on the land where Jacob lays his head on a stone and says a ladder with angels going up and angels coming down that ladder? Why wouldn't we want to live within the, within the, area of where the Machpelah cave is, where our matriarchs and patriarchs are buried. We are in this land to begin with, not because of Tel Aviv or Haifa, but because of Beit El and Shiloh and Hebron. Therefore, historical, uh, ideological, and religious. Another reason is going to be security. In the minds of those who fought in 67, very clear was what happened in 48. And in fact, during the War of Independence, there were times where single kibbutzim held off entire armies. It was true of kibbutz Yad Mordechai holding off the Egyptian army for eight days. It was true of kibbutz uh, Deganya, the first kibbutz ever founded, that held off the Syrian army until reinforcements could come. And therefore, it was clear that the ridge of where the West Bank is, which is uh, we call the spine of the country, needed to be settled in order to the first line of defense until not if the next war would happen, but when the next war would happen. The third reason would be actually come to fruition post-1977 and post-rise of the Likud party when there would be a shift in funds from kibbutzim and the labor party's baby to the settlements or the Jewish communities beyond the green line. Uh, and we'll get to that as well. So it would be more of a financial incentives as land is going to be subsidized and you have individuals who might be living in a small apartment in Tel Aviv who realize I can live on the Western side of the West Bank, 20 minute drive from Tel Aviv and have a big home, just like my family in Florida and have a big backyard with a beautiful view of the Mediterranean. Why wouldn't I take that offer? 
So those are the three main reasons. And then the Yom Kippur War is going to begin. Again, not in a vacuum. We have first a war of attrition in which the Arab world, not yet ready to fully attack after the Six Day War, will bombard our front line of defense, which was a series of military outposts along the Suez Canal and along the uh, Golan Heights border with Syria. And this comes to an end, even though life goes on and parties are happening and people are going to school and, and we feel a certain elation as we ex ex uh, explore our newfound state with all this extra land, not to mention trying to figure out who, how do we deal with the population now that is a part of us, those Palestinians who are living in the area of the West Bank. All of this comes to an end in 1970 when that war of attrition comes to an end. And yet we know also the rise of terrorist groups such as the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which was born in 1964, three years before the uh, Six Day War. So there are those who claim that the terrorism happened because of occupation that may or may not be, but we know that terrorism began before the Six Day War as the first PLO attack happens in 64. That's gonna ultimately have Yasser Arafat, the head of the PLO, uh, pick up the, uh, the uh, reins of attacks against Israel from Jordan. And as part of those cross-border raids, there's actually not gonna be any love loss between the Kingdom of Jordan and King Hussein and Yasser Arafat, the head of the PLO, and in fact, in 1970, uh, in September, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of Palestinians that will be killed by the Jordanian soldiers and the leadership will be kicked out. This will become known as Black September to the Palestinians and a offshoot of the PLO will be created called Black September and it'll be that group that perpetuates or uh, perpetrates the attacks against Israeli trainers and athletes in the, in the uh, Munich Olympics of 1972, and 11 Israelis will be killed in that Olympics. 1973 rolls around, Egypt now ready to regain its place as the leader at the helm of the Arab world, now backed by the Soviet Union, is going to make it very clear it's only a matter of time. And while there's still disbelief within Israeli leadership, both political and military, that the Arab world would ever be able to or have the wherewithal to attack Israel. That's exactly what the planning is going to go into as the Arab world begins to maneuver itself, moving troops towards the border, away from the border, again, causing Israel to fall into a lull. By September of 1973, it's only a matter of time before a war will break out, and yet Israelis are not seeing it. And by the beginning of October of 1973, when it finally becomes clear that in fact there's going to be a war, it's almost too late. Because on the morning of October 5th, which is going to be Yom Kippur, in the evening, Yom Kippur will begin, Israel knows that they're going to attack tomorrow, meaning October 6th on Yom Kippur Day at 6 p.m., so towards the end of Yom Kippur. We get on the open, air, uh, open airwaves and tell the United States, we know that they're going to attack, hoping that, the Egypt, uh, that Egypt and Syria, this time, by the way, Jordan stays out of it, are going to um, hear us and postpone the attack. Instead, they move the attack up to 2 p.m. Now, David Elazar, everyone knew him as Dardo, was the chief of staff of the Israeli military. He asked Golda Meir, Golda, listen, give me a preemptive strike. We have no other uh, choice here. It's only a matter of time before we're in, we're in Iowa, overrun. Golda says, listen, I can only allow for a partial call up of the tank corps because America has said, if you preemptively strike, you're not gonna get one bullet from us. But if you wait to be attacked, you will get whatever you need. Clearly, I'm simplifying the back and forth, but essentially that's what happens. And Israel, in fact, is not seeing a war that's postponed, but rather at 2 p.m., it's going to be moved up on Yom Kippur Day, and Syria and Egypt, in a combined effort, will attack Israel. 
again, to make a very long story short, we know that this war will, well, it could have gone either way. Yet we know we won. How do we know we won? Because we weren't annihilated. There was no middle ground. And that's not saying that it wasn't close because we even know of declassified communications by our highest echelons of our military. Moshe Dayan will say in the first hours of the war, the third temple is about to fall. So there was real fear that it was all over. And yet because of our soldiers, because of their ability, because of the fact that whether they were the regular with their regular service soldiers, the 19, 20, 21 year olds, or they were the reserve duties who were called up and went right to their bases to the front line. They knew something. And while other countries have had their hills, whether in Iwo Jima or in Korea or Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq, and they have fought shoulder to shoulder with their buddies, for the soldiers who fought in 48 or 67 or 73, there is real power in looking over your shoulder and knowing there's no one between you and your home. That statement also should not direct any of you to decide who Uri votes for. Because regardless if you're on the farthest left in Israel or the farthest right in Israel, we all have skin in the game. And it was true also for those who fought in 73. At the end of three weeks of battle, at the end of the Yom Kippur War, Israel wins the war, and yet we lose the war. How do we lose? We lose because, well, we lose because we lost 2,700 Israeli soldiers at a time when we were a population of uh, 3.5 million. And three times that were injured. There wasn't a home in Israel that wasn't affected in some way, not to mention our sense of invincibility. This will shatter who we thought we were. It will change how, what, how we see heroism. In fact, if up until then, heroism was defined by those who fought in the war, so ghetto if we're talking about Holocaust memory. And that was the only way to be a hero or any other kind of armed rebellion against the Nazis. We realize that maybe there's more than one way to be a hero, even back then. That it takes real heroism to give a hand to a child and say, it'll be okay knowing that you're going to your death. Or to put a child on a cattle car and say, I'm coming with you, don't cry. Or to look a Nazi in the eye and say, I'm gonna live another moment, another minute, another day I'll do what you tell me, I'll get through this. It will be that shift in how we see ourselves that will ultimately give us the new museum of Yad Vashem and a, a different direction of how to remember. But that is that period of the 1970s that really transforms how we see ourselves and will open us up to, well, a world in which, first of all, this particular song that you can see. I'm not going to play it right now, but you can start to read the words because this will inform us that uh, of where we were psychologically. We were sure that the Yom Kippur War would be the war to end all wars. And in fact, this war, this promise of a soldier coming home to his family and promising, promising his little girl, uh, I, I promise you, there will not be any more wars. That was truly felt by those who fought. Sadly, it wasn't gonna be the case. And yet, and with this I will conclude and open it up to maybe a couple of questions. I will tell you that while those wars and the wars to come are part of who we are, they weren't going to define us. And the 1970s will really be our step into reaching out beyond ourselves to become a nation of the world, whether that's in sports or music or culture. And as we move forward, we'll, next week, we'll take it from those mid seventies and make our way all the way to 2020 and hopefully have a better understanding of who we are, why we are, and why we care. Okay, thank you very much. Ori, thank you so, so, so very much. So, um, I really thank you all for joining us. I think it's just so important to understand the Israeli story, and Ori does it in such a beautiful, uh, beautiful way. Ori will also um, be one of our tour guides for our next mission, hopefully in 2021, in October. Um, so um, you'll get all his knowledge with being in Israel and seeing the sites in person, um, which you can't really beat that.